think I realised from quite an early age that, you know, life is short. It can be ended pretty swiftly, you know, badly. Um, you're a long time dead. Um, it was that moment that actually changed my life, gave me a focus and allowed me the, the opportunity to dream big and, you know, to set my sights on something quite challenging, which was to become a, an officer in the Royal Marines. My junior school headmaster told me to my face that he didn't think I would pass a single GCSE exam. It's, it's about uh, coming up with a good idea, attacking it with energy and enthusiasm. Mm. And, um, you know, occasionally you have to show a little bit of resourcefulness and, and resilience to, to get through it. But it starts with curiosity and then um, being brave enough to go, oh, I'll give that a go and not be worried about fear of failure and really enjoying it. Um, my time in the Marines and then all of a sudden my dad contracted cancer and then had a, a slow, uh, miserable, uh, painful death, which kind of really affected me. I, I lost a bit of self-confidence at that, at that moment. Uh, I was definitely down and a little depressed. Um, and it was uh, spotted and noticed. And then the worst thing happened really for me. I had to hand all the, all the, uh, the sword back and the, and, the, and the uniform back and my dream had been crushed, you know, and, and it, was a, it was a tough time. And I thought, sod that. Um, I'm not, uh, after those three consecutive failures uh, as an employee, P-A-Y-E, I thought, sod it, I'm not going to rely on anybody else. They could give us a three million pound contract because we'd done 10 million quid's worth of work for Rolls-Royce um, off the back of that failure. And then, you know, essentially before you knew it, we were turning over 30, then 35, then 40 million pounds. If two of us, a partnership, what could you do? We, we were loggerheads. I wanted to take the business to 100 million. He wanted to sell and, and go on holiday to Spain. So we ended up agreeing on the flip of a coin what strategy we'd, we'd follow. And unfortunately, I try not to have regrets, Sam. You know, I, you know, you make decisions, things happen. And, you know, as long as you face life with, with enthusiasm and with energy and optimism and passion and, and, and love and, and kindness, then what, what else actually do you need? You know, success is, it shouldn't be measured in, in, in numbers. It shouldn't be measured in uh, figures and status and ego. It should just be for everybody, every individual. It should be things like uh, fulfillment, uh, contentment, happiness, love, peace. I'm on a mission to help the world to see success differently. Through sharing the stories of our guests, I hope to inspire those that listen. This is the Different Hats podcast produced by H2 Productions. I hope you can join us on this journey. I just wanted to take a moment to talk about one of our sponsors, Nostos, an authentic experience of Greece right here in the heart of Hove. In a world brimming with dining options, finding that one place that captivates your palate and heart isn't always easy. It's about more than food. It's the stories, the ambience, the slice of another world. This is the essence of Nostos, an award-winning Greek restaurant. With traditional recipes passed down through generations, each dish promises a story and a piece of heritage. And Nostos is more than just a restaurant. It's a community contributor. Each dining experience supports initiatives close to their heart, from local charities to cultural events, enriching Brighton and Hove's social fabric. They also provide catering services, bringing Greek cuisine to your personal events. For a taste of Greece without leaving town, visit nostos-hove.co.uk. And when you do go, say Sam recommended the Feta Nests. Oh my God, they are amazing. Okay. Welcome to the final episode of Series 5 of the podcast and the first of the newly branded Different Hats podcast. And wow, what a way to finish off. I'm joined today by a multi-award winning entrepreneur, multiple Guinness World Record holder and former Royal Marine Commando, helicopter pilot, special forces officer and speaker. He's also the author of the incredible book, Adventureholic, Extraordinary Journeys on Seven Continents by Land, Sea and Air. 
from summit in Everest with Bear Grylls to playing cricket at the South Pole to flying a car across the Sahara Desert, he was described by Sir Ralph Fiennes as seriously inspirational. I am, of course, talking about the one and only adventure holic himself, Mr. Neil Lawton. Neil, how are you, mate? Sam, great to see you. Mate, listen, absolutely brilliant to, uh, to have you on the podcast. I mean, we, we've known each other for quite a few years. I, and I, I can actually still remember, I still remember the first time I met you, you'd done a talk at Pub de Van, an event I was at. And I cannot on it, I honestly, hand on heart, tell you the impact that that, that he had on me. Because I listened to you talk about the incredible experiences that you'd done. And I'm going back a few years now. But I remember thinking at that point, looking, going, what am I doing with my life? <laughs> I know. <laughs> this, guy, this guy's achieving all these amazing things. And it certainly, like I say, had an impact on me in the sense of just the way you look at life. And I think so many people listening who will know you from the community, but will listen to your story, will read your book, and just be inspired to go, you know, I'm just going to give things a go. And I've got enough time in a day, I can make that happen, and I can go and do that. And, I, and just with that little bit of self-belief. So uh, I'm grateful for, the, for that first interaction that we had and how, how it inspired me. And, and, and honoured to have you on here to, to share your story today. Well, thanks very much for inviting me. And um, yeah, it's nice to hear uh, that, you know, feedback. Um, very kind of you. Good time. Mate, look, let's jump straight in. As always, uh, people's stories start, have got to start. And I want to find out a little bit, just we do our life in 60 seconds. I just want a little bit of a snapshot, really. Tell me something about life growing up, the shape who sits in front of me today. Well, I was, hu- I was hugely inspired by my dad, who was a naval officer. Mm. And he rose up through the ranks, but he always had a little twinkle in his eye and a sparkle uh, in his personality and character. He was like the life and soul of the party, I, I was told. Mm. Sadly... You know, he died when, when I was quite young in my teens. But, um, yeah, I remember him, you know, uh, sending over a helicopter and, you know, he would let us know by telephone that uh, something, a package would be arriving shortly. So we'd go out into the garden and a helicopter would come over and um, a frozen fish would be lobbed <laughs> into, the, into the back garden. <laughs> he would do, like, amazing things like that, which just stick in your, your memory. But... Um, for me, the defining moment, I think, of my childhood was age 12. I was at school having a miserable time and it prearranged with the headmaster. A helicopter arrived, landed in the front yard. And myself and three mates jumped in. We spent three days at sea on HMS um, Bulwark, which was a, a, a Royal Marine commando carrier. Yeah. And it was doing exercises and manoeuvres in the Solent. Um, and my dad was, you know, two IC, second in command of the of the ship, and he literally, you know, used uh, his his authority to grab uh, his eldest son and three mates to inspire us to join the the, the navy. I mean, I didn't join the navy; I joined <laughs> yeah. the marines. But um, it was that moment that actually changed my life, gave me a focus, and allowed me the the opportunity to dream big and you know, to yeah. set my sights on something quite challenging, which was to become a, an officer in the Royal Marines. Wow. So, for, so that focus for, as a, to, to become a Marine or, or become part of the Navy was from that, from that point? From that that, that three that days on board yeah. HMS Bulwark, um, age 12, inspired wow. me to want to be like those hardened-looking yeah. warriors that <laughs> were doing amazing things Um, You know, they were going off for three hours from the ship by, you know, multiple helicopters, coming back three hours later and then abseiling down uh, onto the moving deck of the the aircraft carrier. And I just thought, you know, they had rifles slung over their backs. They had grease paint over their face, camouflaged. They looked tough and and hardy and uh, manly. (laughs) And I just thought, I want to be one of them. The excitement of seeing yeah, that. Yeah, so that was the inspiration that set me off on, you know, certainly the first part of my career as a, wow. as a soldier. Because it's interesting, I always talk about, especially that sort of school life, and it'd be interesting to, to delve a little bit into that, because you went to boarding school, didn't you, I think? And, and, but like, how many kids nowadays haven't necessarily got that focus not everyone has that my wife wanted to be a solicitor from when she was 11 so she had that focus she's a solicitor now that was always a dream what she wanted to do yeah and I always thought oh, it's amazing to have that from a 
for me. Anna. I think it was a, you know, really lucky for me because actually I struggled terribly at school. I was, really? you know, I wasn't dyslexic or anything. I had no excuse for being stupid. <laughs> but actually, you know, I, I was just a slow learner, I think. And, mm. you know, if I'm honest, I, I really struggled academically challenged. Mm. I think they uh, and I, I've got one school report that actually says, uh, and I quote, Neil is trying very hard, but achieving very little. <laughs> and um, <laughs> that was my geography teacher. And the, the worst thing is geography was my best subject. <laughs> <laughs> so I really struggled at school and um, yeah, but it was a, it was a decent school. It was, you know, a uh, school in Sussex. I won't I won't name it because, um, you know, I had a kind of a bit of a culture of, of bullying. Um, they had this fagging system where the younger boys had to, you know, clear up the mess after the senior boys. And of course, back in those days, 70s and 80s, there was corporal punishment. And because dad was in the, in the Navy, mum would often go off to Singapore for two or three months. I would quite often be stuck at school for months and months, you know, literally not being able to go out for, uh, you know, for weekends and stuff. And so I became the, uh, uh, the flag boy. Um, by that, I mean, when somebody did something horrific, like, you know, all sorts of stuff went on, we'd steal cars back in the day and... Uh, teachers would have, you know, sugar poured in their petrol tanks to destroy the engine. I mean, we got to all sorts of um, terrible mischief. And invariably, some, you know, the headmaster would go, right, who, who's responsible for this? And uh, I remember um, some bloke put shampoo in everybody's slippers one night, you know, <laughs> and it all, 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 all uh, hell let loose. Um, because nobody wanted to be gated for the weekend, uh, I would volunteer uh, to take the the rap for pretty much everything that went on because I you know I was Usually already be, gated yeah. I was going to be gated for months, wow. so the quid pro quo is that uh, I would I would own up get six with the cane or a slipper, uh, take the punishment um, sore ass uh, and then you know the, the the guy who actually did the misdemeanor would come back with a supposedly with a tuck box full of chocolates and and I'd get half. So wow. I'd be, uh, I'd get my so fair share of, of sweeties. <laughs> you made a lot of friends back there. Yeah. <laughs> so it was a, it was a tough life, and um, you know, it was, it was, you know, pretty, pretty miserable experience if you were kind mm. of struggling as I, as I was at school, and yeah. that was my. So to have a focus, to have something that I could really concentrate on, uh, you know, for when one left school was was a real positive yeah. and a real blessing, actually. Yeah. Okay, that's <laughs> I often talk, you've probably heard, and I often talk on here about the education system and how it, it's so geared up and set up just for one type of person almost, isn't it? Like yeah. if you don't fit into that mould or that, that way of thinking or that way of learning almost, you're not going to get on great. And then your first mm. experience in life of what you're judged on is seen as a failure. Like you're seen yeah. as a failure because you're not, I know, there's that famous quote in there about if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a, a tree, you know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> and, and, but that's a great, for me, that really yeah. depicts what's going on. I still don't get it. Like, here we are sitting here now after reading your book and the amazing things you've done and yet you talk about your time in school and your education that, not, that you didn't get on great and that you've gone on and achieved huge amounts of things which I think is so it just sh it just highlights so much of it's more about people's personalities and attitude as opposed yeah. to your academic abilities my junior school headmaster told me to my face that he didn't think I would pass a single GCSE exam yeah does that even <laughs> what benefit had as a, as a teacher as a like you said you, you you've been a, a as a leader of people of men of, and had a, had a someone in charge uh, and a leader have that what impact that, that that's going to have on a I can only I can only say that it was you know 70s and 80s culture yeah, and that, yeah, that's yeah, it sure. really and I think we've moved on generally yeah, oh, there's yeah. still some mean people out there and some <laughs> yeah, not yeah, great sure. teachers I know yeah, yeah, from yeah. my own kids education that the not everybody is a is, is great yeah. at everything um but yeah to to set out to to put people down is not a great start yeah, yeah, yeah. you want to be encouraging and supporting and and helping people rather yeah. than you know dissing them yeah no absolutely absolutely but then what was that how tough was that in the sense like just i guess being at boarding school on your own for that for long periods of time and not having your parents around what was that like for you like as a as an individual well it was 
tough at the time. I, you know, I, I went to boarding school uh, age nine, wow. and I, you know, I would never and haven't sent my children to, you know, to to, to for that kind of punishment because I think it's just it's a little bit cruel if I, if I'm honest, it, you know, but. The plus side, it, it, it helped me be uh, independent, helped me grow up pretty quickly. You had to, you know, uh, fend for yourself mm. and, you know, look out for yourself and back yourself, so so to speak. And um, I suppose it gave me uh, definitely a streak of independence um, and, uh, you know, to a certain extent, cope, cope with adversity, resilience. Mm. You know, one had to, you know, man up and take the bullying on the, on the you know, on the head. <laughs> And uh, deal with it, and and move on, and be be positive. And um, there was a funny story actually. There was um, about I don't know, fifteen, twenty years ago. Uh, I went to do. A, I was invited to a girls' school to do a talk. And just before the talk in the afternoon, I was you know there having lunch with the headmaster, the deputy headmaster, and a, a smattering of house prefects. And one of the the, the head girl, I think from the other side of the table, um, obviously had a pertinent question. She said, um, so Mr. Lawton, it's great, great that you're here and uh, we're looking forward to hearing you speak. Um, but I, I note that you're, you were from uh, School X and um, we have uh, s- such and such person uh, Y uh, as, as our you know, history teacher. Um, did you overlap? I, I said, yeah, um, I remember being at school with Y. In fact, I was in the same house. Uh, I didn't much care for his whipping with a, a wire coat hanger uh, <laughs> predilection, but um, other than that, he was a really nice bloke. <laughs> and, and this guy terrorised me for for about five years at school. You know, really? literally, you know, whipping me with a and, and others with a wire coat hanger. And um, I got my payback about fifteen, twenty years later. I love that. And. Um, about, I did the talk, and, and a couple of years later, I thought, oh, I wonder, I'll check the website out. And, and his list, his name wasn't, uh, <laughs> re, didn't remain on the roster as a, as, as a history teacher at the school. So he got his comeuppance in the end. Love that. So you love bully that. people at your peril. Absolutely that. What a, what a great miss, I love Little that. Little bastard he I was, yeah. <laughs> he got his comeuppance. I love that. And I, I've got, it's one thing I really want to... I guess around that sort of time, or, or I'm, I'm just keen to find out from you because in 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 the book you got Sir Richard Branson said about your journey. It's, it's a wonderful reminder to say yes a little more in life. Well, I want to I want because I'm a bit of a yes man. Right? I, I've and I've developed. Oh, God. oh yeah, say yes. It's an opportunity. Yeah, yes well, you're that. everywhere. Yeah, but absolutely. Yeah, I know. I try, but it can uh, go a bit too uh, far. It can go. Yeah, and and and, I, and I'm and I'm. Uh, I have been guilty of that and learning to go, actually, uh, the power of saying no. But I'm keen to, because of the, look, you read through your book and your incredible experiences that you've done and, and by saying this, where, where did that first develop? Where did you first develop that mindset of going, yeah. I'm going to... Um, I'm not entirely sure. I think it's part of my nature, maybe part of my upbringing. Yeah. But I mean, I, re- I think I realised from quite an early age that, you know, life is short. Mm. It can be ended pretty swiftly, you know, badly. Um, you're a long time dead. Mm. And the other thing I realised that I didn't want to reach 80 or whatever, 70, 80, whatever age I'm going to reach um, and have any regrets and then that was a real driving uh, factor for me to make them the most of life, to take the opportunities that present themselves and to create opportunities. Mm. And um, actually, Sir Richard Branson got, became into my life because, uh, as you pointed out, you know, I, I um, had a, a project plan to climb Everest back in the day. <laughs> and um, 1998, it was uh, my second attempt or third attempt on, on Everest. Mm. And I got six sponsors. And eventually got to the summit of Everest and I pulled out all these flags with my big heavy uh, down mitts and um, in order to take a photograph of each of the sponsors' flags. So I pulled them all out and uh, unfortunately two or three out of my six flags, uh, a gust of wind came at the wrong moment and these flags just fluttered off into Tibet, you know, uh, never to be seen again. I thought, oh my God. And five out of the six sponsors had paid me my sponsorship money up front but guess who uh, hadn't and who's the business guy the successful business guy sir richard branson and he wow. said 
Um, I'll produce the, the money when I've got the photograph in my downstairs loo in Holland Park, he said. And so I thought, I'm never going to get this photograph. What the hell am I going to do? I'm, I need this, you know, the sponsorship. So anyway, unbeknownst to me, and, and please don't tell Sir Richard Branson this, but <laughs> yeah. when I got back uh, to UK, some bright spark had just invented Photoshop, hadn't they? Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. So Mr. Branson doesn't know that, uh, you know, there's a fake <laughs> photograph in his... He does now, yeah, he knows, he knows now. He'll be listening to your podcast, that bastard law to me, he dumb me. That's brilliant, that is brilliant. I mean, even that, like, you talk about then every, your third attempt there of, 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 of doing that. Talk to me then about, like, I guess, with the the previous attempts and stuff like that, that like trying to get there and not, not achieving or talk to me about that. Well, um, you know, for me, I, I set, set a number of um, significant goals when I was a, a late teenager and uh, traveling in, in the Far East and yeah. had one of those restless, sleepless nights where um, you just, you know, it's too hot and you can't sleep and your mind's, do you ever have nights like that where your mind is just absolutely racing? And, many, and many. so I, I got up three o'clock in the morning, went for a walk. I think I was in somewhere near Bangkok or somewhere. And uh, I leant over a bridge and I just saw running water uh, going down this under this bridge. And it was just a moment of tranquility and peace. And I thought, um, I'll just create some life goals. So I put 10 life goals there and then. Uh, one of them was uh, to, to climb Mount Everest. How old was you then? Oh, I was probably 18, 19. Wow. Maybe, yeah, yeah, about that. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, and, of course, uh, you know, such is the way. It's, it's, a, tough, it's a tough gig. Mm -hmm. And um, my first attempt was an outright failure. N not my fault, I hasten to add. It was uh, just coincided with the worst um, kind of storm uh, ever to be recorded on Everest <laughs> when I was going for my summit bid. <laughs> and then, timing, the, and then there, was, there was a few, I mean, you know, people have to read the full story in the book, but, um, you know, yeah. then, then there was a, a, a horrendous situation um, that, that probably the world's highest um, alpine rescue uh, in the world, literally from the south summit of Mount Everest, which is just below the main summit. Uh, my climbing partner collapsed. So um, we had a bit of a, an entertaining time uh, getting him off the mountain safely. Wow. Yeah, so I've had my fair share of, um, <laughs> you know, challenges yeah. uh, whilst climbing the highest mountain on the planet. And we've uh, <laughs> we've come to a few of the challenges a, a, a little bit later. I'm I'm keen to still still on that theme, I guess, with the, and something I'll take away from what you said and what you spoke about before about not only saying yes to opportunities but actually creating opportunities as well is half the battle as well isn't it like some of the stuff that you've come up with just creating those ideas and going I'm going to go and you know whether it be pedal boarding up the Amazon or, or whatever that looks like and all the different sort of things creating those opportunities as well is, is important right? just thinking outside the box yeah. um, you know if you have uh, desires to to travel to um, visit different cultures and to and you know to have nice uh, adventurous holidays, shall we say, <laughs> in different parts of the world, um, which I would endorse and encourage everyone to, to do, you know, it can be quite expensive. So you've got to think, um, and I've just found a little niche way of of coming up with, you know, hopefully interesting, entertaining and inspiring things to do whilst, uh, you know, doing uh, those things, travel, sport and adventure at different parts of the world. And mm. so whether it's the world's highest black tie dinner party or paddling a bath <laughs> across... I weren't here for that one. I, I know, I know, I know. you'd, party, have, you'd have enjoyed that. Party. Three courser, you know, with, <laughs> with champagne, uh, you know, halfway up Mount Everest. Um, but um, whether it's that, paddleboarding down the Amazon mm. uh, or, you know, um, paddling a bath across the, the Solent or... Uh, building a flying car and, and traversing the Sahara Desert. You know, you just come up with crazy ideas or some people would call crazy, but then actually step back and go, well, that's not so crazy. I mean, yeah. people have flown before, people have driven a car before. Why can't you combine the two? Why can't, uh, why can't you take it across the Sahara Desert? And then you just put an operational plan together. You get um, sponsorship 
Um, you know, when you do fun stuff yeah. and you put a good cause to it, maybe a charity uh, as a beneficiary, uh, and then promote it in the right way and enthusiastically with energy and, and passion and, mm. and uh, you know, you put a good team together. All the, all the ingredients in there to have a successful project, mission, uh, challenge. And um, people will back you, as, as you well know. Yeah. Uh, people will, will want to get on board and, and support and uh, they phone you up and they email you and beg you to uh, <laughs> find a space on the team. Yeah. I love that. And I guess there's so much of that that can be that can be related. So a lot of our listeners, business owners and entrepreneurs, but so much of that can be taken from, from that. Well, come, same as running a business, right? You come up with an idea, you've got to, you know, look at how you put a plan in place to make that happen, mm. be enthusiastic, go out and sell it or whatever that opportunity is and make that that yeah, happen, right. That's just, and, and so, go confidently and, yeah, yeah. and passionately, and and you know, with a sensible sensible plan that benefits people. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, absolutely. It's what, exactly like running a business. That's what's always struck me about every time I've heard you speak, or conversations we've had. Your just your enthusiasm and passion for for adventure, but for business, for and just how for you life commute, for life. Exactly yeah. that. For exactly that. I think, and that. That just, I'm always a believer you surround yourself with positive people and, you know, that positivity breeds as much as, you know, fortunately yeah. much as negativity, but you want to surround yourself with people. And that's why I guess you get people on a journey with you because of that enthusiasm, right? Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's about uh, coming up with a good idea, attacking it with energy and enthusiasm. Mm. And, um, you know, occasionally you have to show a little bit of resourcefulness and, and resilience to, to get through it. But mm. it starts with curiosity and then um, being brave enough to go, oh, I'll give that a go mm. and not be worried about fear of failure and, um, you know, all, all of that stuff. So, um, yeah. Because that, that, you highlight that, that fear of failure and that's what, I guess stop so many people like doing anything in life that is that is it they worry about what other people think or they worry just oh, I can't do that because there's mm. always going to be I guess there's always going to be an obstacle to something in life right yeah some opportunity in life there's always going to be a, re a 10 million reasons not to do something yeah just need to find that one reason to do to do it yeah I mean I I, I off I, you know as a purveyor of, of fun and challenges, uh, if you like, uh, I'm only too aware of all the excuses that I've heard over over the <laughs> over the decades. And um, you know, there's 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 great arguments uh, to counter all of them. You know, when people say, you know, I haven't got enough time, then you know, you just got to make time, find the time. Um, oh, my my missus or you know husband won't allow me to to go and climb Everest. Well. Who's wearing the trousers in your life uh, and your relationship? Um, haven't got the money. Uh, put a good plan. We just discussed it. You know, come up with some great, you know, innovative thinking. Uh, you know, put a decent plan together, and uh, you know, people will, will 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 pay pay you to come on board as a sponsor. Um, you know, I've never not done a, a mission, an, an expedition, or an adventure um, because of lack of, of funding. Yeah. You know, there's always somebody who's going to help you contribute, uh, put money in the pot, or you know, if you if you follow those principles, you're going to earn enough to be able to dig into your own piggy bank to pay for it. So, plenty of excuses, um, but um, mo most of them are you know just really not worth the the, the paper they're written on, frankly. Yeah, I'm I'm such a bully. I, I I know a mutual friend. We obviously Bob Starr, who we both know. I've spoken oh, to him. Oh, legend! Yeah, I, I, so much time. I've got to know him a lot over the last couple of years, and and similar conversation I had with him. And what and what resonates with me is that people go, oh, you, I haven't got the time to do that. And I remember saying to him, Why do you find the time to do it? Well, mm. you, exactly what you just said. You just make you yeah. make time. If you want to do something, like you said, if if there was something in business that you wanted to do. You'd get up that bit earlier, and you'd you'd make that happen. Yeah, it's the same with, you know, with a challenge, with training for something, whether it's a marathon or whatever it is. I remember, yeah. I remember reading in the in the book uh, um, about um, or, or the podcast I heard you talk about when you was, um, 
you was training, you'd run to work and back when you were working in the city, you'd put your backpack on, you'd run seven miles in and seven, do yeah. like a 40 mile a day round trip. <laughs> to do yes, that was, uh, that was pre, you know, pre um, uh, special forces, forces selection. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew I had to be fit, but I was, you know, at the time working full time uh, in, the, in the city, yeah, so yeah. to speak. And where I lived in Battersea, uh, it was literally a seven mile run uh, to to the city and um, and then back again seven miles and I would do uh, I would stop in Green Park and do press ups and and sit ups uh, in in between, but you know uh, I arrived at the start line of this new challenge in my life um, absolutely super fit, mm-hmm. and um, you know you just make time like you said um, find a, find a way. Uh, to achieve your objectives um, one way or another. And the one thing I, I've discovered in my life, you know, you know got the grey hairs to, to, to prove it, is that, you know, m- most people I, I come across or interact with, you know, when they're initially their, their thought process is, uh, I couldn't possibly climb Everest, I couldn't possibly do this, or I couldn't possibly start a business on my own. Actually, when they do it and, you you know, you, get, you give them a bit of support or whatever, um, and they realise that they can do it. It's just that wonderful realization that it was really just their brain that was stopping them from believing in themselves and having just having have the confidence to give it a go, knowing that what's the worst that can happen? You could go back to your your uh, nine to five job or whatever uh, you know activity you were doing before or the life you were leading before, um, or the routines and the behaviors that you you know you you got stuck in a rut with. Right. You can change all that. It's yeah. just down to brain power and, and persuading yourself that uh, you have got what it takes to at least attempt it. And people find that they're um, they're really surprised when they when they achieve these things. Amazing, amazing. Well, look, t- t- tell us a little bit about the because obviously you said that there's this focus and this goal to join the Marines. You come out of school and you do that. Tell us a little bit about that and what that was like. Well, I, I was just, um, you know, focused on uh, becoming a Royal Marine Commando and yeah. then uh, being a, a young officer, yeah. um, which unbelievably, despite my academic challenges at school, uh, did uh, pass maths O level or GCSE on the third attempt, yeah. having got a U, the lowest grade that you could possibly get on the first attempt. Um, so it wasn't looking great to start with. And, you know, as, a, as an officer, one had to have at least, I think, five GCSEs, O-levels. Mm. Um, but I managed to scrape, scrape them uh, against the, um, uh, you know, the, the headmaster's uh, comments previous and passed, you know, beat 5,000 candidates to, the, to one of the posts. And then I was really enjoying it. Um, my time in the Marines and then all of a sudden my dad contracted cancer and then had a, a slow, uh, miserable, um, painful death, which kind of really affected me, um, as you might expect, as my, you know, my dad and kind of my hero. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think it showed and I, I lost a bit of self-confidence at that, at that moment. Uh, I was definitely down and a little depressed. Um, and it was uh, spotted and noticed. And then the worst thing happened really for me was that, um, you know, I, I was deemed um, not really solid mentally enough um, and various other reasons. They had lots of, you know, candidates, um, too many officers, not enough positions in the in the Marines. And um, I was let go. Wow. Uh, I was given my P45. Um, and, you know, from a point where age 12, I'd set my my sights you know, yeah. work my ass off to uh, get into the position that I got into as a young officer in the Marines. I'd passed the commando course, had the Green Beret. Um, you know, I was a f- fully trained Royal Marine commando. Yeah. And then uh, to have that happen and then, you know, be told to go and find another career was pretty devastating. <sighs> Cause, what, what, talk to me then about your mindset, man, because that... Like you said, having it's great from a young age to have that dream and that focus and that ambition, and then when oh, failure so, strikes, yeah, yeah, yeah. When when that's t- when you when all your heart is set on something, and that's the only path that you've decided that's going to happen for you, and then it's taken away. Talk to me just about your mind. I suppose yeah. coinciding as well with with losing your dad at, at, at that point as well. Yeah, I was depressed. Um, yeah. As close as I get to yeah. 
what's yeah. called depression. I mean, I I didn't have depression, but yeah. I, I was really down. You can yeah. you can imagine. Yeah. I had a hundred quid in my to my name. Uh, you know, I'd, I had to hand all the all the uh, the sword back and the and the and the uniform back, and my dream had been crushed. You know, and and it was a it was a tough time. Uh, I didn't know. I had no plan B. I was I was all in. Uh, for a, for a career in the Marines, and then it was it was uh, you know taken away. But you know, I think in life you have to you know you have to face your your challenges. You have to face what life um, dishes you, and there are plenty of people who have far worse struggles. Um, but you know that was my 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 depressing moment in 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 my life. I think at the time I was maybe twenty. Mm-hmm. Um, I decided that the best thing for me would be to just move away, get away from uh, you know the, the, the Marines, which are based down in the West Country, um, and I thought I'll just I'll go and bury myself in London. I knew nobody in London, I had no contacts. Um, I I went and signed up into Stockwell YMCA, which was very cheap uh, near Brixton. Um, at the time, there was the Stockwell murderer on the loose in the very street that I had uh, in the Stockwell YMCA place. And so one was dodging a, an axe murderer. <laughs> nine, nine people, you know, seriously, wow. nine people got murdered in, in the space of, you know, a year whilst I was there. So we were wow. dodging and weaving murderers. Um, I was in this little shoebox of a room, a bit like this, um, not with all the tech in it, though. <laughs> Just a bed and a, a, you know, and a, and a wardrobe, that was it. Shared bathrooms and all that stuff. And then I was reading, um, I think, the Evening Standard, and there was little one of those little ads at the back saying, learn to be a sales, salesman. Uh, Three-week training course. Um, uh, become a salesman, and you know, if, you, if you pass the course, you get a job. So I signed up, didn't cost me anything, uh, did the three week training. Most people couldn't hack it. It was one of those door to door office equipment uh, selling uh, opportunities. You know, if you didn't sell anything, you wouldn't earn anything. And so um, I literally did. I kept myself busy. I worked my ass off. Uh, new opportunity. No, it wasn't really my thing. I just needed to be busy, take my mind off my you know situation and something. I knew something. You know, doors would open. I, you know, have that positive mindset. You know, I, I worked hard, uh, earned some money, um, and then a wonderful thing happened. You know, I I, I had a, a bit of money in the bank. I was doing okay. They promoted me from. Uh, door-to-door office equipment salesman. I was doing that plus, you know, training new newcomers into the company. I was the training officer for this company. Uh, and so I was rising up the old greasy, greasy ladder, but it still wasn't my thing. Then um, one of Britain's famous special forces regiments uh, in the army version um, was doing a, uh, a, a 10-year anniversary celebration of the Iranian embassy siege. And there was a little PR in the papers going, uh, you know, the, the, the boys in green had uh, snuffed out some terrorists and a uh, little bit of a jubilation celebration, 10 year anniversary of the Iranian embassy siege. By the way, postscript, uh, we're looking for volunteers to uh, to sign up um, for the next generation of special forces officers. I knew which uh, end of a rifle uh, was the sharp and pointy and dangerous end. Uh, I'd done my training in the Marines, uh, knew, knew that stuff. There was some unfinished business as far as I was concerned. What, I, what had I got to lose, Sam? Yeah. So I volunteered to uh, do selection for that elite organisation. And lo and behold, I managed to cast aside my... my um, miserable life in Stockwell YMCA and that terrible door-to-door office equipment job and I had for a a number of years an opportunity to serve with one of Her Majesty's um, finest elite regiments um, with the motto who dares wins (laughs) it's so much to take it what what, take me back just quickly to that period where how long is that period between you father passing away you coming out of the marines to to being in stockwell and and that period because you you, you talk about it as if it's about four and a half five years really yeah so i'd if you like i'd I'd left the marines i'd had a taste uh you know started my commercial business 
life, yeah, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. And then I had an opportunity to pause that yeah. and go, right, I'm going to do something else for a little bit. And, uh, you know, I served with um, the regiment for, uh, you know, a good few years. Yeah. I'm, I'm keen just to the switch in, in mindset from, like you said, almost being, I guess, depressed or as, as close to that as possible to, to going, I'm going to go to London and just with a positive attitude that to, to the switch what I guess what I, I, I just I think that that. with no real thinking about it I just had to do something I couldn't yeah, I couldn't yeah. just sort of slob around at home you know I'd, I'd left home I'd formally yeah. left home you know a few years before you know I'd left school at 18 I went traveling I had three jobs different jobs uh, p and cruise cruise ship as a uh, schools liaison officer. I travelled to Australia on, you know, on the back of um, uh, doing an expedition for John Blashford Snell for the Scientific Exploration Society to go and find a fire-breathing dragon in uh, Irian Jaya, <laughs> uh, Papua New Guinea. Um, you know, I'd I'd, um, uh, I'd I'd been a survival instructor all in the space of a couple of years. You know, so I'd I'd left home. Yeah. There was no option. I had to you know find a, find a way to 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 be busy and to you know put my woes and my troubles and my depression uh, you know the depressing situation behind me. Yeah. And you know f- for me it was just do something. You yeah. know, just don't wallow in your own misery. That's it again for people listening. I guess. And some people go through tough times, whatever they look like. You know, we all go through, some people can deal with more than others and, and whatever it is. But actually just listening to that and going, just got to do something. Just get up and do yeah. something. Look, you know, I, also, it, it, it's important to, 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 to tell people that, you know, we, we all have struggles. You know, mm. everybody I meet, and yes, I'm attracted to people who have a, a an overtly optimistic, enthusiastic, energetic mm. Uh, character but I know because I was I I suffered as well yeah Yeah, we all have you know burdens to bear but Mm. it's it's being brave enough to show uh, the bright side and then when you have moments you know with close friends that's the time to share your your, you know your struggles it's not to be I think you know broadcasting your your misery across Mm. Uh, a public forum that's not the right place to do it yeah. uh, and then I think if you can do that then you know you attract positive people to you and that's mm. those positive people who have the opportunities in life yeah. and you know they will be attracted to you as a result and, yeah. and then you know you'll you'll find ways to get out of the, the misery and the depression and the disappointments that you've you've suffered or suffering why don't we I, I, I do I want to touch on that man around vulnerability and being able to because because for me as, as we know like I'm, I'm an optimist positive you know often we've talked and with a smile and you know, people i'd like to think people would describe me as that way and like, you, you sure go through are, some, yeah. and you go through some some tough times and you and i i do think there's a i'd like to think there's a caveat there between when you are going through a tough period whatever that's like whether it be on a forum or you speaking to people or a networking event or whatever that looks like and and showing some... I was always scared to go, oh, things are not great at the minute, or I'd, I'd hide that. So everything all right, so yeah, 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 great, great. I've learned over the years, I think, especially recent, more recently, the last couple of years, to actually go, oh, a bit, bit shit at the minute, to be honest. Like, this is not going right or whatever. But, because what I realise is actually by being a bit more honest, I guess, with myself um, and being able to have that conversation doesn't make me then a negative person or mm. someone that's not, not, it doesn't make me take away the values that I've always lived by and who I portray myself as and who I fundamentally in my heart I believe I am. But it's okay to be like that for a bit because actually by talking and actually going, oh, you know what, I am struggling, people have gone... Oh, if you thought about this, and and then all of a sudden your optimism is back because you're asking, I guess, asking for help in some way. Yeah, it's okay to. No, I think you're right. I, I think you know, not hiding stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. But not f- thrusting it down people's throats yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah. because nobody wants to be surrounded by you know depressed and misery and and so forth. Yeah, I think yeah, yeah. 
Um, but being 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 able to be honest with people. So, yeah. for example, you know, if your business is struggling, there's no yeah. point in saying, "Oh, we're, we're everything's Especially great. Yeah, <laughs> we're we're flying. We're you know, it's amazing. We're about to win some awards. You know, yeah. uh, you know, there's no point in in being too uh, you know flowery and yeah. and you know hiding the truth. Yeah. Um, particularly when you're uh, able to, to to ask for help, yeah, you know. Yeah, some yeah. people. I was on a call this morning, um, and you know, it was it was weird. There was one CEO who was absolutely, you know, puffed up. He he, he was absolutely caning it in business, yeah, yeah. and in the same business, but down, you know, different different guy and different bottom right of my screen was actually he, he just looked miserable, yeah, yeah. and it transpired that you know complete opposite he was really struggling with his business and yeah, yeah. you know he was brave enough to say look i'm 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 down to down to my bootstraps and we all rallied round you know we all felt compelled as human beings you know yeah. with empathy and friends of this chap to go okay what about this how about that and we spent the, the half an hour actually helping him yeah. and giving him ideas and, and encouraging him and saying okay well we'll do this and yeah. what about you jim will you will you will you you know find some clients for for you know, X and yeah, yeah, yeah. and all of a sudden, you know, he he perked up and um, you know had a bit of bit, bit of love and support. So yeah, being authentic, being honest, um, n not not you know masking yeah. what the main issues are, but don't thrust it down people's throats. Is my 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 advice. I love that. I love that. So so getting into the the, the special services you've. Like you said, you, I guess scratch that itch that you wanted to. I guess from yeah. the, from the marine thing. felt a lot tick, better afterwards for sure. Yeah, I bet. And, and tick that tick that box like you say. So, and then, but then from then, the business. Talk to me about the the, the business. You set up a you set up a business that you know, over seventeen years, turning over nearly forty million. I think when you you know when you exited. Yes, and I mean that was a reasonable, you know, journey to get to get there. Yeah, yeah, let's be honest. I mean, uh, you as years, you know, you and yeah, yeah. another SME owners will know that, <laughs> you, you know, unless you're Elon Musk or uh, Richard <laughs> Branson, you don't you don't get a business that that turns over forty million overnight. overnight. Right. Uh, it doesn't doesn't work like that. a lot of hard work went in. Yeah. But yeah, actually, the backstory is is uh, you know reasonably interesting in, in so much that, you know, having done my self employed stuff for for a bit, yeah. I then um, after my military kind of service i i went back into the business world back to london um got got three jobs in in quick succession and i uh, thought i was doing quite well and uh, for one reason or another i just got shafted you know um you know one company my md was a fraud and you know basically stole money off me and the rest of the company and the business went down the next one the two directors um, were so keen on golf and fast cars that they basically bankrupted the company. I was made redundant and shortly after nobody was doing any selling, so that went down. And then the third one was the worst. It was the killer. I, I had a, a good job as sales and marketing manager for construction business. Mm. And it was a startup, but it had a, a decent sized parent company. And the MD employed me against my his better wishes because I hadn't got any experience in the construction industry. Mm. But I knew how to sell and I was confident and all that kind of stuff. And I had a sharp suit. Um, good at interview. And um, <laughs> I, 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 he said, well, I'm not sure I can take a risk. I said, OK, um, Mr. King, I'll tell you what we'll do. I suggest uh, if you give me an opportunity, I'll work for you two weeks free of charge doing this role, sales and marketing manager. Uh, for your for your startup business, which was turning over less than a million quid uh, when I joined it, mm -hmm. and if you like what you see after two weeks, you can then offer me the job. And so I did exactly that. Worked worked my ass off for two weeks. Came up with some great sort of strategies. Put them on paper. Started implementing. Uh, of course, I was given the job. Uh, Eighteen months later, things were flying. There was an order book of uh, fifteen million. So we'd gone for it in. In the space of less than two years, me, the only salesman employed, working directly with the MD, uh, went from less than a million turnover to a, an order book of 15 million. Wow. And I thought uh, things were going really well. I'd come up with a 
brilliant strategy. Every Tuesday and Thursday evening, we would go to the industry, a, a company, a third party, uh, you know, to, a, to, to our construction business. It might have been a project management firm, an architect's firm, quantity surveyor's firm. And I'd turn up with a box of uh, chilled white wine and a platter of cheese and biscuits. And at uh, six o'clock in the evening, people were knocking off and they'd smell the cheese and the wine and they'd come in. We give them a little uh, 15 minute presentation on the screen behind in the boardroom. And then I'd open up the, 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 the Riesling and the, and the cream crackers and cheese biscuits. And um, there was a bit of a party. And of course, that's how you make friends, influence people. And that's how we, you know, we managed to get our message across of looking for one million pound plus projects. And, um, and that's how we ended up. 15 million order book. Brilliant. I was called in for a meeting 18 months in and unbelievably I was across the desk. The MD said, Neil, it's not working out. Here's, here's your P45. See you later. I was so stunned and shocked. I didn't even ask the reason why I was being made, um, you know, being fired. Uh, no idea. Uh, it wasn't until about five, six years later, I discovered that um, my you know, sales and marketing manager position was coveted by the MD's best friend who was in another construction doing a similar job, not doing quite so well. And he wanted my job. So the boss gave him my job, fired me, gave, gave it to him. And I thought, sod that. Um, I'm not, after those three consecutive failures yeah. uh, as an employee, P-A-Y-E, I thought, sod it. I'm not going to rely on anybody else. Um, to, you know, sacrifice potential my, you know, future financial security. And I'm going to employ, I'm going to employ myself, I said to myself. And so that's how I started OPL uh, Company, Office Projects Limited. We uh, basically set up the company in a, in, a rage, in a rage, having been fired from that job, in direct competition with the firm I'd just been fired from. And, um, you know, just, it was a good industry. Worked hard. I'd learned a few lessons along yeah. the way. Um, learned from the MD that fired me, and you know, let bygones be bygones. And I and I, I started my my own business. Brought in a, a business partner that knew what he was doing in terms of the building, construction, and we built a, 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 a profitable, viable business um, in a kind of a seventeen-year career that um, that went to forty million turnover. Okay, I'm just going to say something about one of our sponsors, River Val. The world of cars, vans and minibuses is often a pain point for many of us. The hassle of finding the right vehicle, let alone looking after it, are all more things to add to our lists as busy people. River Val's mission is to make motoring manageable, and that's why they provide leasing, purchasing, servicing and vehicle management. So whether you have one family car or a fleet of vans for your business, River Val are your trusted vehicle supplier. Visit www.riverval.co.uk. Okay, let's jump back to the podcast. That's so incredible. And there's, but there's so many things to, to take away from that in the sense that so many people will go, oh, starting my own business, that's a bit too risky. It's a risk to start your own business. Whereas, actually, when you talk about it like that, in, no, in, in that in that form that actually working for someone else is just a bit uh, is almost a bigger risk because at least with, when you've got your own business you're in control you back yourself right yeah back yourself you're in control you can make the decisions yeah. for better or worse yeah, yeah. and i always thought you know um I mean, it's not for everybody i no, mean no, a lot of people absolutely. just you know and i accept i accept that you know it's 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 tough and mm. those of us who have run our own businesses it's a lot of hard work yes. you know it's an, it definitely an easier life yeah. as an employee of uh, American <laughs> Express or wherever you might <laughs> want to be yeah. working in the corporate sector yeah, yeah. but um, you know there's definitely downsides as well yeah. um, but I but I think the the upsides are, are well know. worth it and you can always go back can't you I mean if if it just it's not your thing or you you mess it up you can yeah. always go back and get a if you're, you know, if you like, like you said previously, like what's what's the worst that can happen? The worst that can happen is actually you're right. Maybe it doesn't work out. I uh, to, you know, whether to sell my house or what is a worst case scenario, or I just I've never the had to sell my house. There you go. That's never. A good thing. 
I've been there. I've had two. Have you? Yeah, yeah. But you, like you said, you, yeah. learn, you learn. You do what you, you have learn, to do. Yeah, and you learn from but you back things. yourself. Yeah, yeah. You just you learn from those things. You learn from those. You hope that you learn from those mistakes, failures, whatever, however you attribute it. But you go, I'll take that on to the next one, and you go again. And, you yeah. go. and like you said, the, and it, it's going to come out, especially if we go through more of the challenges that you have faced, especially on your expedition and stuff. But resilience, that word resilience, having that yeah. that ability to just be able to dust yourself off and go again. It's, it, you need that more than probably anything else in business, right? Yeah, for sure. It's a, it's a, it's a big thing. So that's, I mean, what an, what an incredible story from coming from from that to to like you say growing that business and that, I'm assuming as well through that uh, we're, like I said we'll come on to some challenges but some some challenging times through growing that business as well I'm sure what oh yeah I mean we went through um, 9 9-11 um, yeah. you know there was a big dip in in, in commercial sure. confidence yeah. uh, there then we had the financial crisis mm. um, of of 2007, 2007 eight, yeah. nine, and the construction industry was hit really, really bad. And we mm. came through that, and um, you know, we 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 reached a point where, in fact, it was it was, it was an interesting lesson actually. In uh, you know, sometime after that, about 2004, um, we were we were kind of doing sort of fairly comfortable quarter of a million pound projects, and then one day we had uh, a, a really awful bad debt. And it was a, it was basically a client who was was a fraud, yeah. uh, and and he, and he took us for a quarter of a million quid, and it was a real you know body blow because that was pretty much uh, our profit for the year and our salaries for the year. The yeah. two two of us who owned the company, so it was a real stab in the stab in the in the kidney. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I thought about it for a bit, and I, I said, "This, you know, we got to see this as an opportunity. You know, a, we got to tighten up our financial controls, um, but b, uh, you know, what? How can how can we maximise the opportunity that this disappointment and this almost, you know, disastrous strat- situation had had befallen us?" And you know, went away for a couple of days to think about it over a weekend. And I came back to the office, all sparked up, and I said, "Okay." Guys, what we what we have to do to get out of this black hole is to quadruple our our, our project size, because you know we've been doing commercial office fit out refurbishment mm-hmm. projects to, you know, within our comfort zone of a quarter of a million quid, and and I I came back that Monday morning. I said we're we're now looking for one million pound projects, and um, within five weeks we'd. I'd identified uh, an opportunity with uh, BMW uh, and the Rolls-Royce motor car showrooms and factory and assembly plant. And I had a contact uh, at BMW and he managed to get us on the tender list and we ballsed out to get to win that contract. And and that was a, a milestone, and that, that strategic mindset shift of going from comfort zone to stretch or fear factor and or you know bigger scarier numbers um, was was enough just to go uh, yeah we, we we did it you know somehow we did it and we, we we won that contract not only was our first one million pound contract uh, Rolls Royce became our first ten million pound client and then. That gave the industry all of our pros- prospects, our future prospects, tendering opportunities, the confidence that they could give us a three million pound contract because we'd done 10 million quid's worth of work for Rolls Royce um, off the back of that failure. And then, you know, essentially before you knew it, we were turning over 30, then 35, then 40 million pounds, you know, every year. And, you know, this is a company I'd started from scratch with a. A uh, two thousand pound investment of a computer and some business cards and my dining room table in Wandsworth. And then we had the interesting discussion about um, my business partner, who, if you like, I was the optimistic one, and he was the kind of the the safe pair of hands kind of character. Yeah. And then we had an interesting. We've been going sort of fifteen years, you know, forty million turnover. I thought this is a great opportunity to take this business to to hundred million. I mean, 
it had 100 million written all over it. But, you know, rather than take 15 years, it taken us to get to 40 million. I knew that the 40 to 100 would probably be five or six, seven years max. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, we, we, knew, we had the, you know, following we wind. We knew, we just, the, the dial had been shifted. And I knew with the experience and the, and the and, you know, the, the, the rate of trajectory would have been far greater, far quicker. Mm. But my business partner, Andrew, uh, more cautious, he, he, you know, he would go into a nightclub uh, casino and, and, you know, only only bet uh, half of his chips and he would take the he would bank the other half and take it home as cash. I, I you know, me, probably you as well. All in, yeah, yeah, yeah all on black. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know what I mean. So, First off the bat, there so we go. I'm going. No, let's take it to 100 million, and and he goes, no, 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 no let's let's sell the let's sell the company, and and you know, a few, few million quid in the bank, and then we can we can go on nice holidays. I thought, oh no, not really. So we, it was two of us, a partnership. What, what could you do? We we were loggerheads. I wanted to take the business to 100 million. He wanted to sell and and go on holiday to Spain. So we ended up agreeing on the flip of a coin what strategy we'd, we'd follow. And unfortunately, <laughs> I lost. So uh, he said, OK, right, um, we're going we're gonna to sell the business. I said, well, fine. Uh, that's what we've agreed. I've lost the, I've lost the bet. But if nobody wants to buy us, can we take to 100 million? So he, he compromised and said, yeah, if, um, we'll put it up for sale. And if nobody wants it, then we'll carry on. Great. So I was happy. He was happy. Um, we put it up for sale. And unfortunately, some PLC business uh, took one sniff and said, right, we'll snap you up and uh, put, put an offer on the table that we couldn't refuse. <laughs> the toss of a coin. Toss of a coin. <laughs> based on that. Like, is there any part of you that you mentioned earlier in the conversation I want to get to my deathbed with no regrets. Is that not? Is that not one maybe? No, because I, no, I did. I did all right out of it. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure. Um, I'm sure. I'm not driving around in the Rolls Royce <laughs> or anything, <laughs> yeah. but you know, I I managed to send my kids to a nice school. Yeah. Uh, I've not not been able to go on nice holidays and all the rest. I've got a nice house with swimming pool. Um, you know, life's not, not too lot, shabby, yeah, 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 but yeah, sure. um, more importantly, I, 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 I try not to have regrets, Sam. You know, I, you know, you make decisions, things happen, and you know, as long as you face life with with enthusiasm and with energy and optimism and passion and mm. and and love and and kindness, then what what else actually do you need? Yeah. Uh, you know, because there is there is that there is. That, from a financial point of view, there is potentially only so much we need. But, and when that number shifts and there's an extra naught on there, then there's extra responsibility sometimes comes with that. And then that yeah. extra, and then and actually to get to that stage, sometimes there's more sacrifice. I mean, yeah. you, you you will be able to talk a lot about sacrifice, I guess, with the time away from kids going to adventures and all the other stuff that you you've done. So there's. There's that balance there to, I guess, to be had with that. But well, I think the point for me is that business and making money was not my main passion and and and, and forte, and it wasn't my driving force. Never has been. Yeah. Um, I, I think you've probably discovered what that is. Yeah. You know, the books next to you. It's it's adventure. That's what drives me, and that's what that my passion is. And so, um, you know, when you say, do I have a regret not taking uh, my business to 100 million? Well. Maybe a little, but not not a huge amount. I've moved on. It, mm. You know, it's not in, it's not that important in terms of a challenge because it's not one of my, you know, uh, values in life to 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 be mega rich and uh, and to ha and to run a business hundred million. It was a, an a aspiration at the time, but uh, it's now passed and it's gone. And uh, you know, you have to move on. And I I, I have had other challenges that are more important that um, you know I've look, uh, I've enjoyed facing up to rather than doing something that's you know wasn't to be because for me I guess then again and it underpins I guess the 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 whole essence of the podcast for me which is helping the world to see success differently because actually 
you can measure your success based on that financial. If I got to 100 million, that would have made me successful or whatever. That No number, no financial position makes you mm. a success if actually your real purpose in life is this, to go on adventures and experience life to the maximum that you have done with all the incredible things that you've done. That's your purpose and that's where you get that fulfilment from as opposed to a financial Yeah, but that's that's for me. I yeah, mean yeah. other people's other, yours is gonna be different yeah, to mine yeah, 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 and yeah, yeah. different to everybody else's. And yeah. I think, you know, the important thing is, you know, people need to try and find what what it is that really fires like them up. Yeah. And you know, th- there will be some people, I know there are some people who just want to run a hundred million, want to be a CEO of a FTSE one hundred company. Well, good luck to you. Yeah. It's not my thing, yeah. you know. That's the last thing I would want. Yeah, so I mean, I just, I, I do think that I and there are some people I do think even potentially, and I hope that the conversations I have on here, it, th- those people that do listen, and it may be that dream and that ambition for them, but potentially slightly misguided in the sense that when they do get there then there's that lack of purpose and there's not that euphoria moment that they potentially promised themselves that it would be, oh, when I get to 100 million, that's a good. Now, I've, just because I've had the conversations on here, people like we both know, Chris Goodman, Kevin Byrne, people like that who have been on, sat in front of me who have sold businesses for multi, multi millions. Yeah, yeah. Sat there and I know both of them. To, yeah, but to, both talked about depression after that and and tough times that they've had when they realised that actually that they thought they was going for this one goal and that wasn't yeah. it was the purpose and the fulfilment that they had building something as opposed to trying to get to this number. And I think that's where for yeah. me there's society still we still in society measure, especially within business, is someone's success is still measured by a financial status. I it's not a shame. That's it terrible. Is, and I do, yeah. I think and I think conversations like this, books like this that hopefully we open uh, people's eyes to the fact that we're, we're, we're chasing something that's not... I, I think for me, it's it, you know, success is... It shouldn't be measured in, in, in numbers. Mm-hmm. It shouldn't be measured in uh, figures mm-hmm. and status and ego. It should just be for everybody, every individual. It should be things like uh, fulfilment, mm-hmm. uh, contentment, happiness, mm-hmm. love, peace. I mean... I've done four, three trips to Ukraine. I mean, in the last since the war started. I mean, those the people in those that country is suffering so badly. They've not got peace. We've got unbelievable, you know, length of time, um, you know, without people firing rockets at the country. You know, do you know what I mean? Just things like that are really important. So happiness, fulfillment, contentment, peace, uh, tranquility. Um, and you know, f- bit of financial security, a yeah, yeah. little yeah, bit yeah. of money coming in uh, yeah. to pay the bills and and to send your kids to school or whatever. Um, it's all that one really needs. Yeah, Love that. Look, I want to jump in with the. We talked about that challenge earlier. I think we've. I'd, I'd really, really keen. One of our next life sort of in sixty seconds is one of the other points. Is we talk about adversity and challenges we face. You certainly face more than most, I guess. We've I've read quite a few in, in in the book, but throughout all the adventures, throughout everything you've done, if you had to choose one of the biggest challenges, what what, what would that be? Well, one that I've already yeah you've already uh, faced up to yeah yeah. Ooh, um I mean I, you know, I think for for me, um, you, you know, just getting my uh, to the top of Everest was probably one of the yeah. one of the biggest challenges uh, given the um, you know the ninety six attempt um, which was the worst storm in a hundred years I, I, yeah it has to rank as one of the most difficult um, experiences you know sadly uh, on a, on a serious note you know eight people lost their lives during that storm and oh, yeah. you know I I happen to be um, you know fairly fortunate. Um, timing wise to be up high but not too exposed and um, mm. had a couple of pretty uh, pretty torrid nights um, uh, in the death zone at 8,000 plus meters um, next to the in the 
tent next to the guy who wrote the book, Into Thin Air, um, John Krakow. But, you know, that was that was that was a tough time. Eight good people, including Rob Hall, who was a five time Everest summiteer, lost lost their lives. And um, it was a pretty, pretty um, tough, uh, tough experience to to to, to deal with. Um, you know, in some respects, uh, avoidable because a lot of people I discovered, you know, what I learned from that was that there's a lot of people on that mountain that shouldn't really been on that mountain. You know, that there's a definitely a lack of preparation and training. And then uh, just things like experience and decision making, you know, making poor decisions at the wrong moment costs people their lives. And it was it was sad to see. Because you, you mentioned in the book as well, didn't you, about like, maybe Everest has been commercialised Mm. To a degree, where I'll to a massive like, degree, so yeah. <laughs> so you then go. Actually, anyone can then climb Everest. Actually, not everyone can climb Everest, but and and unless you've got the right training, my right experience, knowledge, and 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 stuff like that, a right team around you. To, a lot I of guess, people can, and you know, some incredible stories. You know, yeah. only last year, uh, kind of a new friend of mine, Harry. You know, he he had both his legs blown off in in Afghanistan. And, you know, he, he was the first above, double above knee amputee to, to scale Everest. I mean, he did it slowly, but, you know, just extraordinary. There's some amazing people out there, some, you know, incredible challenges. So, yes, on the one hand, pretty much anybody can climb Everest. But is it sensible to climb Everest if it's your first mountain? I've met people, who you know, who've never climbed another mountain uh, trying to climb Everest for the first time. It's just not sensible. Uh, like you say, it's back to... And again, how we can relate so much of this to business, uh, uh, take it back to the business point of view. It's just about making sensible, making good decisions, making the right decisions. Again, getting the right team around you, all of them things. There's so many... That's what I took so much from the book. There's so many things that you go... You can... Tips, lessons learned that you you, you highlight in, a, in a, at the end of each chapter, and you got so many of them things that you can relate to to, to business, right? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. There was an, hopefully uh, a useful bit, so I would tell a story, as you know, and then and then have um, you know some f- fairly honest uh, top tips and lessons yeah. learned from yeah. each story, each chapter. There was sort of three things that I would come up with that yeah, I thought yeah, yeah. were really relevant to. To people in life, in business, and and obviously, you know, if they were pursuing a, an adventurous expedition like me. Yeah. And and that that, that taught me then through that feeling of the first time you get to that that summit of every sport. That again, back to achievements and that euphoria. Mark, what what was talk to me about that feeling of getting to that? Well, it was a long time coming. You know, it was it was a hard slog getting there. So it was a <laughs> yeah. first of all, it was a hell of a, a relief uh, to to finally reach uh, the top. Uh, I think on my third attempt, mm. um, you know, nice thing to have uh, cracked and just you know, relief. I think was yeah, the, yeah. The, the 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 <laughs> most obvious emotion that I remember having at the time. It was twenty five years ago now. Mm. Um, um, but I but I remember uh, coming up spontaneously as it happens with uh, the words I got onto the radio to um, uh, the base camp base camp manager and I said um, it's Neil we've run out of earth <laughs> love it love it and then um, uh, my climbing partner was was a 23 year old young man called Bear Grills and um, he he suddenly was slightly overcome by emotion. Um, by the enormity of, of where he was and uh, the, the arduous nature of uh, the previous two months of, of scaling this uh, the world's highest mountain. And uh, he, he grabbed the, the, the radio from me and, and checked in on the base camp and said, um, I just want to go home. <laughs> <laughs> fair play, fair play. God, what a... I, um, just like uh, I remember reading it in the thing and talking about that, that and that just the enormity of that experience of getting to the top and and achieving that incredible goal. Just I think one of the things I I took so much like like we we're talking sticking with the sort of challenges element of it, the things that you learn from whether it be failures, mistakes, all of those things. Like you said, highlighting the 
the the different elements within the in in the book that you mentioned with your top tips lessons learned like just i guess going going on that f- format of, of seeing a challenge facing it and working a way around that that problem solving mm. problems that's what i found so much you you, you look at an a situation and and knowing you've got to react and make a decision in a certain way it's, it's some of those how many of them tools have come from the expeditions have come from your life in general but the the, mar- the marine training the, you know the special services is it taken from all of that experience or can you pinpoint like that was that was where i got them that that knowledge from where does that yeah it's an interesting question i think um it's a combination of of life Mm. and life's experiences um, from marines to special forces to running a business to being employed you know it's a it's a smoggers board of lifetime experiences isn't it that, yeah. that gives you kind of you know essentially a bit of wisdom to make the right decision mm. um, you know but the, the the tricky thing is when you know the shit hits the fan, and sometimes it, it does in a in a big way. And there's a few stories in the book where, you know, it's, it's, it nearly didn't end the the right way. You know, could it could have, you know, the flip of the the coin the other way could have been disastrous. Mm. Do you know what I mean? But, yeah. uh, you know, you you give yourself a, a fighting chance when you, you know, when you when you're prepared, when you've trained hard, you have some experience. But most importantly, if you are making generally. Uh, as good decisions under pressure mm. when the, the shit hits the fan or when the, the chips are down, um, that's going to get you out of a hole, in my experience. Yeah. Amazing. And there's one other thing I did want to just just touch on. Because um, I know, obviously, la- last year, and whether you're okay to talk about I know you had a bit of a health sort of scare last year as well. Like yeah, I prostate cancer. No no secrets. Yeah. Um yeah, it was. It was. Uh, yeah, it wasn't the the best news to receive um, last year. But yeah. uh, like like everything in life, you know, you've got to face up to the the, the difficulty and the challenge. And I treated it as a as, as just one of life's uh, challenges. I had good um, good experience with the NHS and and, and a surgeon, yeah. and I took good advice. I uh, succumbed to the. Uh, to the inevitable and and walked into the operating theater with, with a positive mindset <laughs> and uh, fortunately i woke up three or four hours later with um with no prostate and um you know a few months later i was back out um jogging um wow. and, and running getting fit again so yeah and, and uh, I, uh, I guess again <laughs> that feeling of uh, getting that news that no one wants to hear right <laughs> Um, but again, it's it's taking that it's the, the mindset for me, and being able to look at something like you said you uh, you just alluded to there that you looked at it as a as another challenge in life that you've just got to try and overcome, right? Yeah, I yeah. think so. Um, you know, what's the alternative? Yeah. Uh, it's to be morose, depressed, yeah. um, negative. Uh, you know, slink into a you know into the brown sofa and and commiserate and be miserable. No, I don't think that's the right way. Uh, I think you've got to just tackle these things head on with with as much optimism. I mean, I think it helped that that um, you know it occurred to me in my kind of sixtieth year, and um, you know. I'd, I'd f- finished writing the memoirs and the adventure book and uh you know family kids are grow- g- growing up you know it would have been pretty dire i think if uh, their dad hadn't hadn't made it at that time they they might have shed one one or two tears but um i wasn't gonna you know give cancer that opportunity um you know took good advice took swift action uh tackled it with optimism and you know lo and behold two or three months later i'm back on the mend and um you know almost fighting fit again amazing um i just want to if we can did did at that time again i'm always keen to just tap into people's minds and and the strength that you show during them type of periods that was there a point that obviously you know look back at obviously what happened with your dad as well and them thoughts and feelings sort of come back and into your mindset and and not to cloud that judgment but you know they they those feelings 
get dragged up, I guess, from 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 losing your dad at that point as well. Or? Yeah, no, of course. Um, you know, it was just you know, 40, 50 years on. Um, y- you know, the ability of and science and the advancements of of medicine is such that you know my dad was un- unlucky, um, as as our many people in the past they they don't they don't you know they succumb to it they don't manage to find a way to get themselves well again i i was lucky it caught the thing uh, an opportune moment in fact it was weird um serendipity for you so you you mentioned last year 2022 uh, i put a team together and we paddleboarded a, a tributary of the amazon yeah. and there were eight people in my team uh, I, I was one of them. Um, one was a one was a lady, Mariel, you might know, yeah. and um, the rest. So seven of us blokes. Um, I decided, or the team decided, that we would raise money for Prostate UK. All right, wow. back in the day, as we were, as I was planning this expedition to the, the remote Amazon, <laughs> Peruvian Amazon jungle, to do this amazing paddleboarding experience. Uh, 10 day uh, you know paddleboard uh, first people to do a paddleboard down the uh, the Amazon tributary and we were raising money for an, an awareness for prostate UK and I was getting all these messages back as were the rest of the team to you know men over 50 go and get your PSA tested and reading yeah. and I thought oh, this must be something in it I better you know ask my uh, nurse, doctor, the annual medical. Can I have one of these PSAs, please? And um, as did the rest of the team, actually. Yeah. And guess what? Of those seven men in that in that paddleboarding team, four of us, four of us, have, are suffering with with this prostate um, thing. So yeah, it's um, it's definitely something with a bit of bit of luck but actually you know there was a bit of serendipity there wasn't yeah, there absolutely, um yeah. but it just shows you know one little message for anybody listening to this if you're a man and you haven't yeah. had your psa tested and you're over 50 uh definitely go and ask your doctor gp yeah. nurse to have a psa reading yeah. catch it early absolutely yeah wow. and uh, if you do uh, I'm living proof that you can get through it and and uh, you know, lead a, uh, continue to lead a, a fun and active life. This is Geo. Geo runs a scarf company. Geo doesn't see the need for telecoms. Everybody uses mobiles now. But can a mobile really be a business phone? Geo is having coffee with a client, Gabby. Well, actually, Geo prefers acacia leaf tea. But what happens when someone calls? It could be a big new deal. Surely it would be rude to take the call? But many people hate leaving messages. They may just call a competitor instead. What can Geo do? The answer is simple. Turn the mobile into a business phone. With the GoGiraffe app, Geo can quickly transfer the call. Or before the meeting, Geo can simply use the app to divert calls. No more missed calls, lost deals or unhappy customers. Turn your mobile into a business phone today. Go Giraffe. Amazing. Well, look, well, um, I mentioned obviously in the book that there's so many of the incredible expeditions. Um, and you've mentioned a couple that didn't maybe go to plan. I want to just touch on that theme and we've a little bit about failure but what, what, what is your relationship like with failure and what, what what would be if I had to ask you what would be the failure that you cherish the most <laughs> failure that I, I don't I don't go about cherishing failures no. I mean I celebrate success but if I was to ask you that we were, because of how much we learn from our failures right well I've shared a few uh, failures that have turned into amazing opportunities so I, I mean I, w- I would I would literally say um, where there's a failure, there's an opportunity, um, and and I, and I would I, I would kind of leave it leave it at that. You know, I, I've I've already shared the uh, the failure of of my life goal of becoming a Royal Marine and having a career in the Marines that turned into a uh, service with uh, an even more elite regiment a few years down further down the line. 
then that led, uh, you know, my my experiences as an employee, miserable failure uh, <laughs> that turned into me going, OK, I'm going to employ myself, start my own business uh, and end up running, you know, building a business to 40 million and selling it to a FTSE 100 for a multi-million pound sum. I mean, <laughs> what, more, what more excuse, <laughs> what more failures do you want to cherish than than those two or three examples where failure has led directly to incredible success and, and you know... Uh, I love that failure. In, in, in failures, we can create opportunity. That is something I'll tell you. I love it. I love it. Well, look, we're coming to sort of there's so many other questions that I want to tap into and we're coming towards um, a couple that, that, that we mentioned about I mentioned in the book about it at the end of each chapter mm. about the free um, about your top tips lessons learned and there's ones in, in, in it after each chapter if if you could go back and talk to a teenage Neil if you could pick that's just a long time three. ago. <laughs> if, <laughs> if you could just pick three of that of your Ooh, top tips, okay. what, um, what would they be? Well, I'll I'll pick three that I know because when I was writing the book, I was thinking about what what are the what's the what's the you know the the secret of 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 my success, and I think it's probably just having right the way through my life having an adventurous mindset and, and being open to challenge and uh, challenging myself, getting out of my comfort zone and, and, and stretching my, uh, my, my vision for the horizon. And I think uh, amongst the traits of an adventurous mindset, uh, three, three things, there's actually six, but I'll, I'll, I'll mention the three which yeah. happen to coincide with your question of, of the, uh, the top tips and the lessons learned during uh, the course of the book. And the first would be curiosity. And I think if people aren't uh, curious, then you're open-minded to opportunities. You'll see opportunities and you'll be open um, and willing to accept opportunities. Then the second is uh, courage. Because once you've sniffed an opportunity, it takes courage to actually take the first step to to follow a, a new path or to accept a challenge or to do something uh, out of your comfort zone. So curiosity and courage are the first two. And then invariably, as you know, and we've discussed, um, you know, there are problems, difficulties, roadblocks, obstacles in that journey, which whatever it is, I don't think anybody in life has ever had a completely smooth uh, transition from baby to to death uh, w without issues and problems, have they? And so you kind of need, uh, I think, the ability to be resilient. And uh, you, in fact, Sam, you talked about it earlier. Yeah. Resilience is a is a wonderful quality if you can if you can have that as a muscle memory, something that you you experience and you build up uh, over time with experiences, life lessons. Um, you know, being able to cope with adversity, change disaster and step out and get out of bed and, and and challenge yourself and continue and to progress despite all uh, that's a wonderful quality so curiosity courage and resilience would be my top three uh, life lessons learned and top tips for anybody out there listening amazing I could I know what I couldn't I couldn't agree more and I think I look at my I guess I look at my kids now they're only eight they're coming up to nine the twins are Lovely age. Yeah, they are. It's magical. It is magical at the minute. And I, but that cu curiosity, massively, I do a resilience. I try and build in them all the time. And they're the, they're the two for me that they just jump out and I go, I just I always want them to be. I guess one of the reasons I do this because I'm so, I am curious generally. Like having the opportunity to sit opposite people like yourself and and find and try and just delve into people's mindsets and listen to their stories and their journeys and it just it's it fascinates me right it's just an, mm, good an for incredible you. incredible experience so i'm very grateful very grateful but where um look, uh, there was one there was one thing so i've spoke to a lot of people on here olympic champion sally gunnell has been on and mm. loads of professional footballers and as we mentioned um, people, multi-millionaires who have built business and stuff like that. Where I'm constant, especially within the business world, I guess, or in life in general, we set ourselves goals and, and things we want to achieve. There's that pursuit of achievement. Hmm. 
I guess, what a, a, a bit of self-discovery, I guess, last year for me, um, where I was sort of trying to be a bit more present, wherever I am, trying to be a bit more present at the moment. This helps me do that. Because mm. when you're having this type of conversation, you go, I'm, I'm listening on you every word, I want to be able to have that conversation. I'm here in that moment. I want to try and be like that when I'm at home with the kids as well, oh, yeah. and whenever I'm whatever I'm doing when I'm with my wife and or whatever that is that looks like trying to be more present um, but when your brain works in a certain way and you have got that constant want to achieve or I've got to try and get there your brain's always working so you don't tend to have that I'm just keen with everything that you've done that incredible I guess self-belief that you can achieve as much as you have done if you just to look back at I guess and, and ask the question whether that continuous pursuit of something mm. is there because I've asked myself this question I, I, is it that that's driven by a search for something deeper mm. um, so uh, yeah, that's a tough question mm. I would say um, I refer you to my earlier answer of, of what drives me is uh, challenge and uh, opportunities to to do things, not to have a dull life, not to not not to reach eighty, and uh, to have any regrets. I, I think I, that still holds. But if I was to delve a little deeper into your question and go, why is Neil Lawton driven to do these sometimes crazy, <laughs> yeah. uh, dangerous uh, missions? Um, I wonder whether it's all the way back to, you know, 10, 11, 12, as a young schoolboy, mm. when I was really struggling. And, you know, I was getting those that terrible report, uh, Neil's trying very hard, but achieving very little. The headmaster telling me I wouldn't pass any GCSEs, but he, he passed me through to senior school after, incidentally, I was back term. Do you know what that is? Um, yeah, you, when it, when when you don't quite make the grade in junior school, yeah. and I was expecting to go up to senior school, yeah. age thirteen, twelve or thirteen, and the the powers that be decided, the headmaster, the same guy who said I wouldn't I wouldn't pass any exams, he said you're going to have to redo that next the, that last year in junior school. So all my mates went up to the senior school, and I remained in bloody junior school. And it was those sort of depressing experiences, uh, I think, that really, to answer your question, probably was a driver to, I'll fucking show you. Yeah. I'll fucking show you. Yeah. And, you know, fucking climb Everest, join the Marines, get into Special Forces, uh, climb Everest. I'll show you. And so does that answer your question? Yeah, it's probably, if I'm honest, I am really kind of thought of it really until you answer, asked that question but um you know it was it was being on the back foot from an early age and uh, and, and, the, and the, those negative experiences that I had to endure back in the day as an a, a formative years you know in my preteen years really kind of quite psychologically damaging yeah. potentially yeah, yeah, that sure. drove me to go I'll fucking show you yeah. What would you say to him if he was sitting in front of you now? To, to oh, I'd be as good as gold, polite <laughs> as you like. <laughs> would you go, here's a signed copy of my book. I bet the you bastard's can... <laughs> dead. <laughs> wow. But what... and, and just, I guess, if you sitting back now after writing your book and doing what you've done, which must have been really cathartic and incredible to put together and just actually go... Take a moment just to go. Well, I've fucking done quite a lot. To well, it's, it's like it's like climbing Everest. Actually, um, mm. it's a hell of a relief because I'm no, you know, uh, Stephen King. <laughs> um, I had no idea that I could like write a book and um, not send people to sleep. And actually, thankfully, unless people, hundreds of people have been really, uh, you know, disingenuous and and um, lied to me. Uh, genuinely. I haven't had too many complaints that it's uh, it's a dull book, so I'm really just grateful and thankful and and uh, kind of pleased that 
um, it's it's been reasonably well received. And in fact, um, even Jeremy Vine, uh, who's a, a friend of mine, Radio 2, uh, I taught him to ride Penny Farthing. And wow. um, he's remained uh, kind of a, a friend. And he had me on his show a few weeks ago. Mm. And um, he kind of did a rather nice plug on, on his show and asked me a few questions, um, slightly shorter, more direct questions than your, yeah, yeah, yeah. your style, Sam. But, yeah. um, uh, you know, within, within hours and, and days, uh, my book had reached sort of Amazon bestseller number one on the, on the list. So, you know, thanks to uh, a bit, bit of publicity on, uh, on Radio 2. But um, I'm just generally pleased and happy that... Um, it's been well received by um, you know most yeah. most people that have read it. I think. Oh, it, it, honestly, it is it's such a it's such an inspirational book. And you listen, and again, back to it took me back reading going through it. It took me back to the first, like I said earlier in the introduction. That first time I heard you speak, where you just go, wow. Just to, and like I said, I think I learned something from that day. And so, and again, like where you go, I can go and do that. I'm going to go and push myself and I can go and achieve that. And you can, you read the book and I, 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 I test anyone to read it and not go, not question and go, I could do that. I could achieve something like that. Or I can achieve more than what I am. Yeah. Now. And everyone has dreams, don't they? Yeah, and of course. and it, I think it's important message. And, you know, one of the reasons I, I wrote the book, uh, apart from a bit of egotistical, you know, um, you know, let's get my, my memories and memoirs and uh, adventures on, on paper. But actually, seriously, it's, it's, it's about showing people that there is a way to uh, realise your dreams. Everyone's got a dream. Uh, well, they... I, I, everyone's got a dream. Everyone's got a dream. Right? But see, I, I posted something about this very recently, actually. That what, what is it that when, and, and this is living proof that, that you don't have to stop, right? Because I, I, I think so many of us, are, as kids, we have dreams. And actually, society gets hold of us at some point when we get that job, and then maybe we get married and we have our mortgage, mm. and then we go, not get into a rut, but you get into to life, right? And society, and you go, yep. And your dreams just get a little bit forgotten. What is it that, when, as a, as, a, as human beings, what what stops us from being kids and dreaming big still, and still and having the ability to go, I am just going to go and do that. That's a dream of mine. That's an ambition. I'm going to go and do that. Yeah. And st- and of well, I say it's never too late. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People got to discover what the dream is if they yeah. if they haven't if it's in a dark uh, recess of a of the brain or in a in a cupboard in the corner you know dig it dig it back out revisit it put a put a realistic plan together to achieve it and believe in yourself that you can do it because you know honestly uh, anything is possible and people will surprise themselves at what they can what they thought they couldn't do but they could they can do. Uh, uh, one thing I was going to ask you as well: you get to that point where you go, you've just wrote this book. Is it is this now the time? And you go, oh, I've achieved all of I've achieved. I'm okay now. I can just. Sort of I kind of thought that, and then I look at my schedule this year, and I'm going, <laughs> Oh my god! You know, I, there's no chance I can retire yet. <laughs> I was just about to. So I literally, I think I see a post yesterday or the day before about uh, an expedition. Is it you, do, you to the poor? Or you you got it's, honestly, else it's just up. one thing after another. So I thought I was only going to do three major expeditions this year. One to one to um, uh, lucky enough to have a, a nice uh, relaxing week skiing next week. Um, yeah. I'm taking a team to to explore Vietnam. Nice. And um, then, then I've got uh, a trip to um, back to Nepal for the world's highest bike ride, where we're going to, you know, install uh, tech and connectivity to the the, yeah, the remotest awesome. school yeah, in yeah, the world. The one, sort of and the then, way. literally yesterday, a mate of mine goes, you know, off the back of my three trips to Ukraine in in recent years, um, he literally messaged me yesterday. Neil, fancy uh, climbing Ukraine's highest mountain um, on, you know, the 500th day or the 700th day of the the war, uh, you know, and flying a British and Ukrainian flag. Slava, Ukraine. Oh, all right, James. (laughs) (laughs) Well, so... uh we can expect uh, uh, another book in, in, a, in a few I, years' time. I, well, <laughs> maybe maybe not, but um, uh, we'll see. Amazing, amazing. Just as we're coming towards the end, for the last couple of questions, 
Um, People are going, thank God that oh, it's coming no to way. an end. Oh, God, mate, honestly, I, I was writing these questions. I was like, but what about that? Well, I want to ask him that. But then we're going to have to do a part two. We'll have to do a part two anyway. But I just want to, if you could pick with all the incredible things you've done, multi-million pound business, climbing Everest, up the Amazon, flying a car, all them things. If you had to pick one, that magical moment, would Everest be the one? Would <laughs> what would it be? Oh gosh! I mean, there there, there are so many uh, wonderful experiences that I've had. Wonderful euphoric moments. Mm. You know, you've mentioned a few climbing Everest. Mm. Um, you know, getting my helicopter license, um, getting a, a uh, becoming a Royal Marine Commando, getting badged with a, with a sandy coloured beret. I mean, there's uh, so so many wonderful. Um, moments in, in my life that that you know kind of touched me that you once had to work really hard for to achieve but actually at the end of the day uh, to, to answer your question I'll, I'll, I'll pick one that um, maybe come left of center so I recently uh, just got back a few days ago taking my family to Nepal to the Everest region mm. They've heard, you know, all their lives, my kids, stories of Everest. They've now read stories of Everest. There's articles all over, all over the internet. Of, you know, my six expeditions on and around and above and uh, Mount Everest. Um, not just climbing, you know, the highest dinner party, <laughs> the, uh, the, the Glenshaw in, the, in his wheelchair I took to, to, to Everest 20,000 feet. We did the Bear Grylls Mission Everest flying paramotors. And then, of course, you know, the two highest dinner parties as well. And, um, you know, my kids have grown up with the, this this mountain in their psyche. And my wife has had to live with the other woman in our uh, marriage, uh, Mount Everest, you know. And um, so I thought I'd take the bull by the horns. I'll take them out there to see the great mountain from a little bit of a distance. But we, we trekked up to... Um, uh, nearly 4,000 metres, beautiful views, had a lovely trekking holiday with uh, wife and family and the kids. Wanted to show them, you know, that part of the world, not glitz and glamour and high-rise buildings of New York or wherever, Disney. Uh, show them a bit of real real life, real third world, um, how most of the world lives, not like us uh, privileged people in Brighton and London and so forth. And we had a lovely, lovely trip. But the one moment I'll pick is uh, quite independently, with no pressure from me. We had um, we had we had our ten days trekking in the mountains, and then we had three days relaxing in a lovely city called Pokhara, west of Kathmandu in Nepal. And it's got a beautiful lake and a fantastic uh, panora panoramic views of mountains, uh, Machu Picchu, the fishtail, the sacred mountain in in the background. And my kids walked past a, an adventure uh, playground type shop and it was promoting uh, bungee jumps over this massive ravine, you know, uh, in, in, on the hills nearby. And um, all three of my kids went, yeah, I'd like to do that. And I watched them as a parent uh, leap off this, you know, platform with a bungee strapped to their ankles, uh, confident as you like, knowing that, uh, you know, they would they would survive it. And uh, it was just a really wonderful, proud moment as a dad seeing my, my kids leap off with complete confidence, uh, something that, you know, when I did it back in the day was akin to committing suicide. It was just a... <laughs> Just one of those, I don't know if you've done a bungee jump, but it's it's like committing suicide. Yeah. And just seeing my kids go leaping off with supreme confidence, knowing that... Curiosity, um, courage, right? Curiosity, courage um, and resilience, yeah. yeah. There's a few others in between, but um, that was a lovely moment just a week ago. What an incredible story. What a lovely thing as well as a parent. To and I know, I now know, you know, and I didn't push them into doing it. It wasn't my idea. They just, they saw the, the poster. They, they went into the shop and inquired, can we, I wonder what that's like. Oh, yeah, I'd like to do that. And then they did it. They had the courage to do it, the curiosity, the courage. And then 
Um, you know, they, they did it. And I know, know uh, as a dad, if I get another form of cancer and I can't, don't make it to next year, I know my kids are now all right. What a lovely way to come to all, all the final. I just and if I urge anyone, they read the book and it and all the incredible things that you like I've said that you've accomplished and amazing achievements. And to give me that answer, what a, what a wonderful thing! And it leads me on to that thing of, and I know we've sort of alluded to it a little bit earlier we were in our discussion, but the whole essence of the podcast defining what success is, and just just again use what you you previously but just to just to define that for me as we as we as we come towards rounding up it, well it's not about uh, how much money you've got in the bank it's not about what type of fancy car you drive it's not about having the biggest house in the street i think it's success is is about um, being content it's about having fulfillment it's about leading a, a life of uh, of kindness with peace and uh, enjoyment and having fun you're a long time dead. Mate, absolutely brilliant. There was a, there was a great there was a great um, clip I saw, and I've reposted it a couple of times on social media um, by a, a guy called Les Brown, who wrote about the ghosts of your potential past. Who talks about getting to your deathbed. He said, and you look round, and he said, "There's all the ghosts of all the dreams that you." you had the opportunity to take and you didn't and they're all there and they're on your deathbed and they look round and they say we was ready to take that jump with you mm. and you didn't do it and now we're just going to die with you and he asks ask yourself this question today how many ghosts have been around your deathbed and I'll sit opposite someone I don't think there's going to be many ghosts around would I be right in saying that <laughs> I was thinking I've never heard of Les Brown oh, but really? um uh, it's, an, it's an interesting analogy, and uh, yeah, t- just thinking: have I got have I got any ghosts? I don't think so. I, I mean, anyone read the book? I'm telling you, it's absolute gold, and it will inspire you to live a fulfilled life. I think that is the for me the thing I took so much from it. Just the opportunities that we can take in our in our lives, and what we can go on and achieve with a positive mindset, with curiosity, with courage, with resilience, we can go and achieve them things. And, and, and ultimately self-belief. And, uh, um, mate, uh, honestly, uh, like I said, I could sit here chatting to you for, <laughs> for a lot longer and we're gonna... Well, people I'm have sure got things to do, got jobs to go to, and so um, we're, uh, we're, uh, we're children we're, to feed, so... Uh, we're, we're, we're after, we've we're chatted after probably up. long enough. <laughs> But, um, it's been a great pleasure. Nice, yeah. nice chatting to you and going a little bit deeper than the, yeah. the uh, the typical Brighton uh, you know networking event where yeah. you it's it's short and sharp, isn't yeah. it? Um, it's a lovely opportunity to dig a bit deeper into the psyche, and yeah. um, it's been a real pleasure chatting to you. Thank you, mate. Honestly, it's been been an honour getting to know you over the last few years, certainly, and um, and having the honour to have you on here as well and sharing your story has been brilliant and. And the book was was amazing, so I'm I'm grateful for for that, and and grateful for your friendship and actually inspiring me. Well, on well. behalf of all your listeners, who I know are big fans, and and for good reason, you are an incredible individual yourself, and you do so much for so many people. Uh, so I'd like to take the opportunity, on behalf of everybody listening to this podcast, to thank you, Sam Thomas, for all the incredible work that you put in. Uh, to help other people and um, for the you know the business community in particular and for many other strands that you touch, including, uh, I know, the Rocking Horse uh, charity. So uh, well done and thank you for all your hard work and success as well. Thank you, mate. And that, uh, as they say... It's a wrap. A wrap.